Welcome to The Microscopists, a bite-sized bio podcast, hosted by Peter O'Toole, sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. Today on The Microscopists. This week on The Microscopists, I'm joined by Spencer Short, the Institute Pasteur in Korea. We will learn more about his role in developing core facilities from his time in Pasteur Paris. It wasn't called the Magapole in the beginning, that's when we started getting grandiose. The perils of driving in France. While I'm driving, I realise actually some cops in their car. I'm thinking they must be looking at my British number plate, thinking who's this weird guy with all of the stuff in the back of his car. The benefit of having mountains on your doorstep. They make it very easy for you to climb mountains, quite impressive mountains. And the role of science in society. In fact, the idea of service uh, and science and the, the sense of science having a, a function, uh, that uh, it has a role in society, became very uh, powerful for me. All in this episode of The Microscopists. Hello and welcome to today's Microscopist. Today I'm joined by Spencer Short from over at the Institute of Pasteur, actually in Korea itself. Morning, I actually, is it more, I suppose it's evening for you, Spencer? It's evening here. It is absolutely evening. Yeah. So we haven't caught up in ages, so I've got loads of personal things I want, I want to catch up on. Uh, so actually, I'm going, to, I'm going to straight out. You know, we haven't caught up much since you started over in Korea. Uh, our career started at roughly the same time in, I know you're a bit older, uh, we've had that discussion before in the past, so I know you are a bit older than I am, but actually we both started uh, in core facilities back at roughly the same time. I think you started in Paris in, what, what year? 2001, August, yeah. Okay, so and I was York in 2002, October, so we both started and you, so you started the facility over there, the Imagapole. Yeah. It wasn't called the Imagapole in the beginning. That's when we started getting grandiose. Um, in, in the beginning, it was called the CID, the Centre d'Imagerie Dynamique, the yeah, CID. What? The Centre d'Imagerie Dynamique, CID. Yeah, see, that still doesn't help me. What does that mean? Yeah. It means the Centre of Dynamic Imaging which doesn't sound so good. CDI didn't sound as good and it's confused with other terms and acronyms in French. So it became CID as in El CID. Yeah. <laughs> that didn't last long. It got changed very quickly. Someone made it in and wanted to change the name. Within about a year and a half, I believe the name had changed to the, um, to the, you know, the imaging platform, something else. So at least it wasn't the, at least it wasn't the analysis of dynamics because that would have just been sad, wouldn't it really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Choosing an acronym is really important. <clears throat> so if we pick up from there, because I, I, you did your biochemistry uh, degree, so actually we both biochemists uh, from the start. You then did your postdoc in Bristol and then actually postdoc across Europe and the US, where, in the USA as well. So where did you go in the USA? So, yeah, when I finished, I finished in Bristol. We, I was in Bristol postdocing for about, I guess, three or four years after my PhD. And um, uh, the first place I stepped to outside the UK was actually France. I ended up in, in Paris for not that long, maybe a couple of years, uh, working as a neurophysiologist um, in imaging. And um, uh, from there, I ended up in Charleston, South Carolina, uh, having run out of money for postdocs and fellowships in, in Europe. Uh, I saw an opportunity with um, a group that was actually uh, an old um, competitor to my PhD mentor. And uh, he saw my name and actually recognized it, which you know, only about 10 people in the world might have even recognized who, who I was or what, what I was doing at the time. And uh, so he, Steve Frawley, actually uh, uh, was in the Medical University in South Carolina and leapt to the opportunity to bring this young 
this young scallywag into the US. So I got an opportunity to work in the US for a few years, a couple of years, two, three years. <clears throat> so I had to and I loved Charleston. It was a fabulous place. I, I loved South Carolina and everything about it was just delicious somehow. So why leave? Yeah, why leave? Why leave Bristol, frankly? Bristol's a fantastic place as well, you know, honestly. Uh, and you always have that question when you're, I, I think every postdoc I've ever known that ever got any pleasure out of what they were doing and living where they were living, uh, always went through that, why leave? I don't want to leave, I want to stay. And they try to grow roots. And then your PhD mentor, or your postdoc mentor says to you, you've got to move on if you want to make <laughs> your career. So you're kind of forced out. Um, you, you're, you're made to move and they, they don't like stones gathering, gathering moss. Um, so uh, I, actually I left because I got an opportunity back in Europe and that was the opportunity to come back to, to, uh, to Paris, back to Pasteur. Uh, so that was, you know, in a nutshell, I kind of made this trip out to the US and then ended coming back to the first place I stopped off at once I left the UK. That's it. But I, you did your, you did your uh, PhD in Bristol, but obviously you're not a Bristolian. Your accent is certainly not. West I'm from Bristol. London. I, I was born in London. My family on my mother's side hailed from um, uh, South East London and North London. Yeah, cause, so cause I was born and brought up in you, Muslim. You, you sound like an Arsenal fan should sound a gunner. My dad, my dad is an absolute total gunner Arsenal fan. He's sick as a dog when they lose to Tottenham, especially. Um, I, I did not, I tried not to affiliate too much to one or the other. When I was 13 years old, I remember being chased by the Arsenal clock end uh, down the street because they thought I was a Spurs supporter. And in fact, uh, I was a Leeds United supporter at the time, which really put me out of place. <laughs> so. It wouldn't have helped. I'm a Leeds fan. That would not have helped. Yeah. <laughs> I take it you didn't get caught. I did not get caught, but it was a pretty scary thing. London in the 19, end of the 1970s, being chased by, you know, what we would call football hooligans, uh, who could be, you know, they could be quite violent people, given the opportunity. <coughs> I'm quite proud that I actually picked up a gunner's accent, but there you are. <laughs> <laughs> it just shows how, how regional London can be, doesn't it? <clears throat> I've got to say, so actually Arsenal would be, I've got a soft spot for Arsenal. Uh, my uncle was a big Arsenal fan. I, I spent so much time, he was like a grandfather to me, uh, spent so much time together listening to the football. He was a big Gunner fan, which I'm not. So I've always got a soft spot uh, for that. Um, I have to, because of my father, my father went <laughs> into Arsenal. So I, that's as much as I'll say about it, though. I don't want to get drawn into the... Uh, the tribalism of it. <clears throat> yeah, you're not a big sports fan, are you? I I love to watch great sports. I, you know, but I can watch any sports. I can I can watch. You put me in front of a sport and say a little bit about the background of the two teams, and I will enjoy it. There's no <clears throat> question. I'll see the skill in it. I was um, I I enjoyed playing sports when I was young. I played basketball to club level and um, football and cricket, uh, also very high level and did athletics as, as well. I was actually very sportive when I was, when I was young. Um, and that kind of all ran aground somehow. Um, <coughs> yeah, the tribalism in sport is, uh, I think sort of this subscription to being a, you know, one team or another, it just never really appealed to me. And I, I kind of shied away from it as I got older. Uh, it became much less interesting to be a part of that tribalism, which is kind of, you know, it's just a, a way of being, I suppose. But I love to watch a great football game. I can sit and watch high quality football and really get a big kick out of it. Oh, well, I guess, especially if it was uh, football and the ball was a bit high, then you certainly get a big kick out of it. Yeah. Uh, so coming back to your time in America, how did you, how daunting was it for you to move from, uh, from the UK first over into Europe and then to America? Was that daunting? Were you by yourself when you traveled? Did you have a partner? <clears throat> when th there's kind of an amusing story of how I arrived in um, Paris initially, I was working, I, I had a job, really a sh quite a short term job in a hospital working in the uh, Cochin Hospital, Hôpital de Cochin, in um, uh, the centre of Paris. Uh, 
and the job was in an inserm unit working in neurophysiology. And I drove from Bristol, um, having partied with all my friends in a big farewell, I drove from Bristol with all of my belongings in the back of a car, a Golf, and uh, I took the ferry, got into Paris, and I arrived in Paris Sunday morning, uh, January, freezing cold, uh, must have been like something like the 5th or 6th of January. And um, I thought it was, it was wonderful. I was tired, but I was excited. And I thought, I didn't speak any French. I had nothing. I had, actually had no French whatsoever. Um, and there were very, very few people on the streets. Paris is, you know, people wake up late and play late. Um, so there were really not very many people around. And I remember driving with all of my stuff looking. This was a time where you didn't have GPS, so got a map out and I'm trying to work out where I'm going and uh, I'm thinking how friendly people seem I'm speaking to them in English and shouting from the car which way could I go to get to the hospital and everyone's been very helpful and um, while I'm driving I realize actually some cops in their car I'm thinking they must be looking at my British number plate thinking who's this weird guy with all of the stuff in the back of his car and the cops are waving to me as I drive by and I'm waving back to them and they're smiling and calling out to me and I'm smiling and calling back to them and um, I eventually arrive at destination and I'm absolutely convinced what a wonderful place France and Paris must be and uh, it wasn't until I uh, later had parked the car find it found that was the time you could park more or less anywhere and realized that I'd driven the wrong way up one of the longest one-way streets uh, in the whole of Paris from more or less the exterior all the way into the interior. And the cops had been very generous. They were just sort of, ah, foolish Englishman, you shouldn't be doing this. But no one really stopped me doing it. And no one chased me from, they just waved. <laughs> <laughs> Are so, you like, stop, stop. You, you just thought it was a friendly I, way. I think they have been saying stop now in retrospect. So I actually did start to try to learn French after that. I thought it'd be important to learn to speak French at that stage. <laughs> also to look at road signs would have been helpful too. Um, so yeah, I, I moved from there to, to the US because of an opportunity that, that, that arose in the US. And one of the things that really struck me was arriving in a country that speaks English would think that would be pretty easy. Arriving in South Carolina, actually nobody could understand a single word I said. And I swear people in Paris could understand me better speaking English than people listening to me speaking English in South Carolina. They did right. not understand a word I was saying. And guess what? I didn't understand a word they were saying. So somewhere with the accent, the adjustment didn't make any sense to me. But I think more so in South Carolina, being British was a fascination. So people were interested in you because you were British and they wanted to hear you speak because it so, sounded so bizarre to them. So I kind of I kind of enjoyed that. And there was definitely a fish out of water feeling given South Carolina is the home of, you know, um, effectively a history of slavery. Um, you know, it's quite a challenging place for people of color um, and has a long, uh, quite tumultuous history with regards to the the Civil War and um, a lot of that is sort of still there. There was a lot of Confederate flags and uh, a notion of the Grand Confederacy, the, the statues and the um, uh, the uh, the plantations. In fact, you can still yeah. visit the plantations. They're very beautiful places to visit. In fact, and uh, that was for me fascinating. And I had never, you know, my my background is as a Caribbean on my father's side. And um, uh, going to South Carolina was, frankly, a scary thing to do. And most of my family on my, my, my father's side found this remarkable that I would even consider the possibility to go there. But it was work. And um, so, so you realized you realized that it was going to be like that before you left there to go there. I had the stereotype in my mind. So basically, uh, we have stereotypes where I, I had never been to a state in the south uh, of the US apart from Texas, I think. Uh, so I knew very little of what is the south of the United States. I knew bigger cities or I knew California or you know other parts of the US where I have family. And um, going to South Car Carolina was a complete fish out of water experience, but it would be for most any American 
living in the uh, uh, metro you know metropolis yeah. cities of the, the northeast or of uh, the west coast um, there's a definite sense of a stereotype and you use that stereotype to try to judge what you're dealing with um, I learned very quickly that stereotype was not right and that in fact I did a a disfavor um, of perceiving the stereotype and trying to judge people based on the stereotype. And it wasn't a matter of color uh, or type. It was everything I thought I understood about it was based on a fiction. And actually the reality of it was much more human and much more uh, exciting and, um, uh, and engaging. I, I actually really fell in love with the culture. I think it's a wonderful place. I'd recommend anybody to live there for any, you know, if they had the opportunity. And you learned the language of course as well. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah, I sure did. did. Where am I eating pants? <laughs> it, oh, I, I look. I'm on a microscope. People don't often see me on a microscope anymore. Yeah. So this is. I, I presume this is over in Pasteur, looking at who we've got in there. That's John Eve, I think. Is it at the? That is John Eve Tinevez and Florian Huckel. and uh, that is them stood next to uh, a microscope which. We were very proud of both of them contributed enormously to a project over several years building this one-of-a-kind beastie uh, that um, effectively is a, a microscope that uses micro mirrors to try to shape uh, uh, angular projections of light into the into the focal plane of the, the image and um, it was a it was a labor of love but it was a funded labor of love and uh, I think this image is uh, Jean-Yves actually handing over uh, the controls of the microscope to Florian, who was then going to take over the development on the system. And um, Jean-Yves had, uh, uh, of course, built something in um, uh, LabVIEW to control the microscope. And uh, this is him uh, showing uh, Florian what they can do with the spatial and angular illumination on the, on the system at this time. I, this picture is it means quite a lot to me. These these guys were uh, really stalwart in the lab. They were great developers. They were great people to work with. Uh, they both sort of moved on to other other areas and aspects now. They're both still in Pasta. Um, we're still sort of associated one way or another. But at that time, we were all kind of working together in a space where you could brainstorm and live out your dreams a little bit in, inside the, the lab in the development space. So it was kind of a fun time. It was, it was, it was interesting there. You said that this was funded. Uh, and I think that's a key point, actually. So for those who aren't familiar with core facilities, core facilities are classically technical staff. So don't do primary research. We're there to serve I, I, to, to an extent. Some people really hate that word, by the way, but we're there to support users. Uh, but when we do our own research, it's not we have just like any academic group, any classic research group, it needs to be funded mostly because it's not otherwise we're using the institute's funding if we just do it our own. But uh, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, I, I'm absolutely with you on that, Peter. I think this is a criteria that um, certainly all the people working in, in, in our facilities, I think, are um, uh, definitely all believe the same, uh, the same mantra. Um, it's if, if, you, if you do something that has a value, um, that value should be recognized by peer review somehow. And I think the funding is not so much how much funding you get. Um, it's more about having the peer review of what you're doing. And so having that officiated peer review, I think, is really a critical part of the process. And I think this allows then to, 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 to make for the liberty of research uh, I love the word service, uh, and I think um, from what I know of you, Pete, I think you do too. I think that that's part of the motivation of being in science, that it's, uh, it's a privilege to be able to take liberties with you, spending a lot of money, spending a lot of resources, uh, to do things that might be deemed a little bit crazy in some, some cases, to take chances. And um, that can cost money, and it's you you work with few resources and often when there's few resources that drives things forwards um, but at the same time you need to have that 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 um stop no go uh type go no go type decision making point and mm -hmm. that can often be through peer review i think that that's really very critical 
Um, so whether it be funding or whether it actually be uh, internal review is, is another way to do that. Uh, we use funding though as the main key criteria to allow engineers the opportunity to develop their own ideas. They, they make an exchange of buying a little bit of their own time back or being able to employ somebody to work on a project that is a pet project for them. Um, if they can bring in money to fund postdocs or PhDs or MSc students, then go at it, you know, have at it. Sorry about that, Spencer. I just dropped out for a second. Uh, thinking about your the patent side, though, and the, the that side, it's not the only thing you actually spun out itself. I think probably you're most famous for outside of science, or oh, that's not the right word, outside of your facilities and your direct ships and everything else, is Stratacore. So that's a, a startup company for a, a booking, charging system. How did that start at? What motivated you and what kept you motivated to see it through? Because this, this is no small task, I assume. Yeah, it was a much bigger task than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> yeah, um, it, I guess it's no longer a startup, I guess, because we've been around for um, this is our 10th year of full operation. Um, this would have been back in 2010. Uh, we came to a point where we were running a software that we had written in the facility. Uh, we were using that software to manage uh, our own affairs to manage the um, the access to the equipment, billing processes, uh, some of the administration, user management, these kinds of things. And uh, that software had been running since 2003, and it was built uh, a priori by the team when it was in its infancy, at a point where there were just uh, four engineers, including myself. And uh, effectively, we were challenged to make available the equipment we had. Um, and so building a software, we had one IT uh, guru, uh, young Matthew Marchand was working with us at that time. Uh, and he, in a summer project when he first arrived, decided to lay out a, a sort of plan. Yeah, this is, a, so I Matt is, is the, the guy in the middle there. And, <laughs> and um, uh, this software got, I think we broke it within about a year and a half. Uh, the team broke it. Uh, the users broke it, and we sort of worked out what was wrong with it. And we came back in and redid it then to the requirements of the voices of the engineers, the voices of the users, the voices of the scientists and researchers using the equipment, and came up with something that was much more substantial and looked like it would go on much longer. Uh, and we began to get requests for the software uh, among our colleagues uh, through Elmi and places like this when we would go to, to meetings. And eventually we started to help others, giving them the software directly. They could then deploy the software in their own space. But of course, we eventually started getting calls for support. And we hadn't really counted on that. So we started giving support to third parties across three continents. We would have people in Australia, in across Europe, uh, in the US. Uh, and we got to a point where we couldn't do the support any longer. And that was after about four or five years, we got 2010. We got to a point where we had to do something which was effectively either spin it out, give it to someone else, um, sell it, uh, or build it ourselves. And we went for the build it ourselves um, because I think at that time we were, and still are, very <coughs> much focused on um, being a part of the community. So there's a purpose to have these kinds of solutions, which is that you want science to benefit from it at the end of the day. So in the same way the core facilities are there to facilitate researchers to do their job, then um, uh, we saw the software as being a way to facilitate the facilitators. And um, in that sense, uh, I think that that was really the motivation and it, it really still is. The people that put their hearts into it and their minds into it, the users that give us feedback. Um, we've got tremendous labs around the world using the software now and they regularly criticize us in order to drive things forward and we you know we welcome that and take uh, the opportunity to develop the software and the net result is is, is basically uh, been a great success um now as i say 10 years in uh, we have over 200 clients around the world 
uh, including you know some of the top imaging labs uh, that we're very proud to, to serve. Uh, I've got to say, so we don't have Stratical, uh, sorry, uh, but <laughs> I love the company. I love the team because the team, uh, you, you mentioned there, it's part of the community. And I, I think the likes of Leonor that are there, they really are part of the community. Uh, you go to meetings, it's all about academics and academics, and it's not actually. Uh, hmm. A lot of the companies have real scientists and people who are part of the community integrated in. And I think actually the team you've got set up there is phenomenally good at being part of the community. And don't just look after the company. They, they are interested in us, regardless of yeah. who you buy from or anything. They, they, they're just great people, actually. So I think you've done really well choosing hmm. and, uh, or being lucky. One way that I think there's a bit of both. Always lucky. Well probably lucky I think so. uh, of bringing them in so you've done two big steps in your career uh, and developed it uh, through those companies but it's not just companies because you've gone through your your undergraduate your PhD your postdocing around different places went back to Pasteur set up the Imagapol into the the very successful entity that it is now uh, I was going to use the word beast or monster, but they have negative connotations too, and it's certainly nothing negative. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to, to review your facilities in the past, and they're, they're, they're exceptional. Uh, they're inspiring for other facilities. So looking out from the outside in, you can see where you can aspire towards uh, and the team around that you inspire within it. But then you ended up over in Korea, and now that's quite a different role that you have. And I, I, I don't actually know everything about your role. So this is Chief Scientific Officer at the yes. Institute of Pasteur Korea. That sounds like a pretty big deal. So tell us more about, I really don't know much about it. So please. Yeah. Uh, so I, the way to begin is probably to say what Institute of Pasteur Korea does. Uh, so IPK, as we call it, it's a part of the International Pasteur Network. Um, which for those who don't know, so there's the Institute Pasteur in Paris, uh, and then there are 32 institutes distributed around the world, mostly in um, uh, uh, endemic risk disease, infectious disease risk areas, um, historically laying out a footprint of, um, if you like, a kind of soft colonialism of, of uh, French interests around the world, so parts of North Africa and um, uh, countries like uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, that have uh, uh, histories with uh, French um, diplomacy, if you like. Um, and then some of the newer institutes like Shanghai, Montevideo, uh, in Uruguay, uh, IPK, uh, have actually been founded on the basis of um, introducing new technologies. So historically, these international network was founded on the basis of a need for a vaccine, for example. So you might come to Cambodia and uh, you would you would want to establish um, uh, a vaccine for smallpox, let's say. And so you have to find all of the utilities, the, the animal models that you need to use, et cetera, to generate what you need in order to generate the vaccines. Uh, so they would do that locally. And so there was a public health need that they were answering nine times out of 10. IPK was not founded on that basis of a public health need to serve a specific need. So IPK being Institute Pasteur Korea, just for clarity. Yeah. Yeah, just to clarify, so IPK as we call it. Um, it was founded on, on the need to uh, discover new drugs uh, for the infectious disease space effectively. Um, so it was unusual in the sense that uh, it was founded in 2004 uh, on the basis of a heavy investment on the part of the uh, Korean government uh, in collaboration with the Institut Pasteur in Paris. Um, <clears throat> and some collaboration from the French authorities, uh, and then the local government regional collaboration from the so-called Nongido province. Uh, and effectively, uh, this investment in 2004, something in the range of uh, uh, 300 million dollars, uh, uh, laid out a 10-year plan uh, to develop um, phenotypic imaging. So using imaging microscopy as a high throughput tool uh, to read cytological profiles, to read the, the, the image profiles of cells and use that as a screening tool. So this way we reasoned that we could uh, introduce um, uh, models based on infections such as malaria or uh, um, 
uh, hepatitis or whichever infectious disease you, you care to choose and build a cell-based model that could then be imaged uh, in a high throughput context and allow us then to screen in the range of tens to hundreds of thousands of compounds to find uh, new drug candidates. And we've had some degree of success in tuberculosis or if some degree we've had great success in uh, uh, tuberculosis. Um, actually have a drug being spun out uh, actually at this point in time um, in Africa has just gone to clinical 2B, um, phase 2B trials. And um, uh, we are working on antibiotic uh, resistance and um, uh, new antibiotic alternatives, uh, effectively, along with some cancer models as well and uh, hepatitis. Um, we have worked on COVID and are working on COVID right now as well, uh, and have been using repurposing screens uh, in that context. So effectively, it's an early drug discovery institute. That's, um, that's what IPK does. And my role in it is to uh, help negotiate the um, rejuvenation of the institute into a new era that is being driven more by uh, new types of uh, imaging technologies. Um, so we're sort of updating it uh, at this phase. So, so that was going to be my next question, actually, because uh, you set up as a, almost a high content screening, the imaging side going through. That There are new technologies that are very disruptive, I think, in... Mm -hmm in just looking for new vaccines, new uh, modes of activity of disease uh, to help our understanding. So where are you moving the technology towards? What new technologies are, do you see as really enabling and, and game changers? I think the, the, right now, if we look specifically at uh, a high content phenotypic uh, screening, the actual process of catching the image um, seems to be pretty much optimized from the point of view of a conventional uh, imaging space. So, you know, having multi-channel uh, fluorophores giving you a signal that you can measure and uh, get an understanding of whether a cell is impacted or not in a model. Um, there are now opportunities that I think are mainly being driven by the informatics space. So in fact, it's not so much the microscopies that we might introduce, it's more about the the framework of, and the context of the uh, workflow for the image analysis, which I think is being driven now by, by deep learning um, and dare I say it, um, artificial intelligence approaches. Um, but let's say deep learning is really the key here uh, and, uh, and machine learning processes. So even actually quite, um, quite um, routine systems now are being equipped, routine softwares for imaging now are being equipped with machine learning uh, approaches where you can click and learn the phenotype of your choice and then distinguish it from, uh, you know, a change in that phenotype. Um, I, I see the future now as being uh, a rejuvenation of the equipment so the equipment can actually uh, be, in terms of hardware, actually be locked into um, a context where it can be used both in BSL-3, uh, you know, high-end uh, biosecurity context, uh, but at the same time, is amenable to good data management. So having these big data flows where effectively we would run screens classically in the past and just end up with screens that would be put on magnetic cartridges and then put in a box and would be completely uh, unusable to us afterwards. So we'd have a dose response curves and we'd be finished. I think now the future is gonna be that data stays live. Uh, and so um, things like Jason Swedlow working on OME. These kinds of things are critically important for the future because I think data management is gonna be the first step of generating, if you like, um, a corpus of uh, images that allows us to really get a handle on using uh, deep learning and um, uh, 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 machine learning type approaches. So I, I, I'm gonna challenge, there's two things. Firstly, you said you, you, you were very cautious of the word artificial intelligence. And actually people say that I've got an AI brain. And then I realized it wasn't a compliment, artificial being not real and the intelligence not just so not really intelligent at all. So actually that's when they say I've got an AI brain, they're just saying I'm pretty dumb. Uh, but if we look at the things like the, 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 the using deep learning, machine learning and artificial intelligence, it sounds so simple. Uh, it sounds like we can make massive steps forward really fast. And yet that integration of data management, the application of deep learning, 
is really frustratingly slow. It sounds so conceptually easy to put into play and just do it. Yeah. But the <laughs> need for uh, evidence beforehand, the ground truths to prove it and to, and to teach the machine learning, actually it's proving really, really difficult. And what we can see with our eyes, it, it, we can learn so much and yet the computer still can't see some of those subtleties and learn those subtleties. How many years before it starts to make profound impacts, do you think, for machine, deep learning, machine learning, artificial intelligence, put those together. How, how long until we really start seeing that being commonplace and making big steps forward? So I like to think about it in terms of what we've seen already. And I think in 2004, when this institute was founded, it, it had, you know, it was a one trick pony. It had one thing to do, one job, and that was to automate uh, imaging microscopy into a high throughput context, which would mean being able to handle tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of samples a day. And uh, that was achieved within about 10 years from start to finish, uh, literally from putting the building block down uh, to having a working institute uh, that was equipped. And uh, that was at a time where, as I remember correctly, a lot of, a lot of experts did not see the value in that for academic pursuit. They saw it only as a, uh, something that would be used by drug companies to find drugs. Uh, and in fact, the value of, of high content screening has been not that, in fact, it's been the, the academic value. Um, we see now publications, uh, enormous numbers of publications coming out now that are releasing screens at the same time because that was a part of the academic process. So that throughput is not something that should just be for the industrial purpose of generating drugs. And that's certainly not how we, we, we use it. But given it took 10 years to get to its pumping and working and making results, now we've got to 15 years and well, it's getting kind of old and uh, it's a bit outdated and we need to replace some of the high throughput systems and we've got to replace some of the pipelines. We've got to replace some of the computers for sure. And um, I think that it'll be again, the, the in, deep learning has just sort of burst onto the scene. Um, and we're seeing a lot of computer scientists generating algorithms right next to labs that are using them for infectious biology and for cell biology. Um, I believe there are lots of challenges there that have to do with computing power, um, uh, frameworking, pipelining, workflows, data management, decisions about rigor, reproducibility, all that kind of stuff. I think it's gonna take another 10 years to get that so that 10 years from now, we can walk in and go, God, this is easy, isn't it? Bang. You'll press the button and your malaria parasites will be counted in a blink or your diagnostic in field on a microscope will be done through a smartphone. But I think it's gonna be about 10 years for that to really happen in a way that is sufficiently accessible, i.e. cheap, um, uh, and therefore of a use to the popular, uh, the popular, um, <laughs> Uh, uh, the larger part of the community. Yeah, I, I think what you just pointed out there is pretty, again, sounds simple, <clears throat> but actually what I wanted to do is say, I want the computer to pop out and go, have you noticed there's a different subpopulation here? Yes, there's actually right. a cluster, a population. Yeah. And then we have to work out why that is important and then challenge and look at those questions. Right. So yeah, this is challenging uh, in itself. I, I'd like to now come to challenging times for yourself personally. So actually, I, I'm going to start here. So th th this is, uh, this looks pretty horrendous, actually, this picture. This is, I presume, your car? That, yeah, that was, um, it was actually a lease car, which was good. <laughs> <laughs> so th this is, just for anyone who's listening, this is completely written off. Uh, it, yeah. It, I, there's there's nothing left really much left on the front the side the side of the is pretty battered yeah I, well, that's in france that's actually in a field about two three kilometers from the village that i live in uh in france uh i was driving to pick up my wife uh in a car that we'd had for you know a couple of years uh actually one of my favorite golfs of all time the uh, the golf seven i think it is and um, I was picking my wife from the airport and I just got out of the, out of the village 
and it was summer. And as you can see, all that grass, that's fields of, uh, of wheat and barley. And in fact, as the wheat and barley gets high, some of the faster roads that cut across the fields, the visibility gets reduced. So you have to rely on knowing when the four-way crossings are coming and follow the French rule, which is give way to the right. So at every four-way cross, you would look to your right and make sure that no one was approaching you because if they were, you would have to stop or slow down and give way to them. Uh, and indeed, as I was contemplating this, looking to my right, probably going a little quick, uh, as everyone does in that region. Um, uh, a, a chap in a, another car, a similar size vehicle, going quite a bit faster than me, came from the left and had not looked to his right at all. Um, and proceeded to, as you see, take the front off my car. The entire front of the car was destroyed in the impact. And I, I put that, yeah, it was a challenging time for so many reasons uh, that I could go into. My wife was coming back from, um, uh, you know, a family uh, bereavement at the time, returning from to, to the airport. I was recovering from uh, long-term absence from the lab because I had actually had a long-term uh, illness myself and was just recovering and everything was coming together. It was all hunky-dory. Everything was looking up. It was going to look up. This was going to be things getting better. And then a drunk driver, a guy who just had a couple of beers too many during lunch, uh, tore through my car and actually would have killed me if you see the way the front of the car has been impacted. A millisecond difference would have been that impact to the driver's door, uh, which is the door behind your, your, your head there, that's the driver's side, it's left-hand drive. Uh, that would have been the end, pretty much. And I, as I remember spinning in the car, the car going out of control, I was thinking, bastard, I love this car, bastard, I love this car, bastard, I love this car. <laughs> and as I, I spun and came to a stop, uh, really a long way into the field, because uh, I'd been hit so hard, um, I remember thinking, shit, the car's written, oh, excuse me, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Swear words, you have to bleep that. Um, I remember thinking, are my legs still there? That was the first thing I thought. And um, sure enough, actually, I was lucky, it was a modern car. And basically everything deployed to protect the, you know, the individuals in the car. So I was actually very lucky. I wasn't seriously injured, few broken ribs. And the, um, I think the explosives on the, on the, the airbags had uh, broke, you know, actually injured my, my, my hands and stuff. But it was, I, I was very lucky to walk away from this. I was livid, absolutely livid as well. <laughs> I, 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 so, the, so the airbags still look fully deployed and, and I don't, I, think you don't even, I think you just sent me your whole family album of pictures. So you probably don't know what you've actually sent me because it looks like <laughs> the airbag probably. actually stuck to you. <laughs> so, <laughs> this looks like you are now wearing the airbag. I presume this is a Cat 3 or Cat 4 facility at this point in Korea. That's, I, yeah, that's a rare appearance of the CSO. Uh, the, the, the scientific director in the BSL-3 labs where the high content screening happens in IPK. Uh, and I think that that's Miho Kim, I think, in uh, the group of Suntech Kim working on COVID, in fact, uh, doing COVID screens there. And I came in just to um, egg everybody along and take a look at how things were progressing. And so we, we were silly for a moment in the, in the BSL-3. I guess it, but, but it obviously didn't work. <laughs> 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 so what i have no idea what this is it doesn't look very comfortable though <laughs> <laughs> this is uh the leg of my son after he had in south carolina uh which we i still have family in south carolina i actually met my wife in south carolina i didn't mention um i met my wife in south carolina and my mother in store my mother-in-law still lives there and we go back ever, ever since um I guess 20 years now, we've always just gone back to South Carolina every summer. We love to swim there, it's a beautiful swim. And it's a beautiful swim until about late August when the sea begins to fill with jellyfish uh, on the South Carolina coast. Uh, North Carolina coast actually is sharks and Florida the same. Less sharks, mainly dolphins and jellyfish in South Carolina waters. Uh, and my son, for the first time in all of the years he'd been swimming there, actually, 
run into a jellyfish. And there it was, a poor guy. Um, he limped around for really quite a long time after this. And I always remember thinking, this has never happened. We didn't believe this was possible. <laughs> this was meant to be a warning sign to think before you leap. <laughs> So I, say, I, I presume you didn't treat it in the way that everyone is told me you're meant to treat it. Uh, in fact, we did We did not do what you're thinking of. <laughs> yeah, let's not go there. Otherwise, yeah. you're really in trouble. You're, you're in trouble if you do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, bad pun. Go on. <laughs> um, in fact, we, we didn't treat it. And, and you're, you're better off, actually, to let the... the um, you know, to use soothing creams and just a very traditional antihistamine type approaches. Um, there, there was nothing special to do. You've just got to get through the initial 30 minutes of absolutely blinding pain. Uh, that um, to this day, I, I'm amazed that my son still loves to swim. He still loves to go in the water there. I think if that had happened to me at the age he was then, uh, I think I probably wouldn't get back into the sea ever again. Do you still drive? I do still drive, but I don't I try to avoid it if I can, actually. Yeah, okay. I say you, you had that bad experience, but you still drive. Your son had a bad experience. He, he still swims. Yeah, yeah, there's there's a truth in that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, to, to a degree, anyway. So, so you've got how many children? I have one child who's a handful. No, he's not. He's a <laughs> one kid. Um, yeah, we have one, one child, my son. Who is, um, have they... How how old is he now? Now he's uh, he's seventeen years. Uh, so, old. did your did your wife and your son follow you to Korea? Yes, in fact, my wife was probably one of the main reasons that we decided to come here. In fact, uh, I was not completely convinced. Um, I'd been involved with the institute at the beginning. Uh, mm. I wasn't sure it would be a. Uh, a good use of, of my time. Um, but in fact, yeah, I, I think at a personal level, at a family level, uh, this was like a little family mission. Um, we felt that this was something that we could do together uh, as a family, and somehow it would be a binding experience facing the challenges together, etc. Uh, and in, in fact, that's exactly what it has uh, turned out to be, uh, a binding experience. And... I presume this is in Korea? That's actually a picture. My wife loves to walk and she also loves to take pictures. She's very good at taking pictures, unlike myself. Uh, and this is actually a picture that I'm, my, my wife has taken. Uh, I seem to remember she took it when I was with her, in fact, um, running off with the camera, giving me the dog, saying, wait there, <laughs> and running off and taking this picture. as She saw the opportunity to do so. It's actually a park that... Believe it or not, we live right in the center of Seoul, but this park is like a little mountain that is not even 15 minutes walk to get to this point from our doorstep. So you can live in an apartment and see all of that city there, but uh, Seoul is just full of mountains and Korea is just full of mountains. So there's mountain walks everywhere. There's a mountain be behind the Institute where I work, where people go and walk at lunchtime. And you have these beautiful views that you get. You have to climb up sort of fairly steep pathways, but the Korean government loves to make people walk and they make, they make the, the, the paths very gentle so you can, you know, they're, they're kind of carpeted in, in, in uh, uh, grass and uh, uh, sand to allow you to move around easily. They make it very easy for you to climb mountains, quite impressive mountains. Uh, and you get these beautiful views. So everyone is into walking here, uh, which just surprises me. You've got a city of 15 million people. Everyone is walking. Everyone is really taking the opportunity to enjoy mounting up, you know, hiking up mountains. Because it, it, it actually makes a really good Zoom background. And I feel really guilty because I am in the middle of this brilliant picture, completely ruining your wife's picture because it is a stunning picture. You said your wife listens to podcasts on a, as I think you, your words are storming around the park. So uh, is that because she gets really cross with you or <laughs> no, I'm joking? She's, uh, she's a power walker. I can't and so this up. is your pet dog, I presume? that This is my pet dog that made the journey with us. So we took our dog and our two cats on the family challenge. Ooh, I have those uh, as well. I was told in no uncertain terms that, because I would have dropped the cats, I think. 
I was told in no uncertain terms, if the cats didn't come, no one was coming. <laughs> yeah. I, I've got to say, I, I feel really <laughs> intimidated by these two cats. One looking <laughs> at whoever's watching this right now and the other one looking right at me. It's, it's, that. <laughs> it is a, an intimidating <laughs> picture at that point. So I, I started off at a challenging times. We looked at the, your personal life and some of the things that's happened there. What about in your career? What has been the most challenging time you've had to face? And how have you overcome that? I think, with the, I mean, there, there are probably a lot, there's probably a whole series of things that I could say were challenging. They were challenging in different ways. Um, and for different reasons, at different phases of your career. Things that challenge you when you're, a, when you're a PhD student or, you know, burgeoning postdoc are really different to the things that you, that will really challenge you sort of downstream. Uh, standing up and giving a talk was challenging when I was doing my PhD. It was, you know, you, you had the anxiety of standing up and presenting your data and it was hard enough to actually put it all together. Um, now, somehow all of that's been facilitated and automated and you can put a slide presentation together of data in literally in seconds nowadays. So I imagine what challenges a postdoc now is for PhD student, a young scientist, probably different to what challenged me back in the day. Um, I think the biggest challenges I faced have been probably the decision of where I was going. I didn't really know where I was going when I chose to do science. I knew I wanted to be a scientist. <clears throat> I'd known that since I was um, old enough to think, uh, quite honestly. Um, but I didn't know where I wanted to be a scientist or how I wanted to be a scientist or where, where, where it would take me or what, what I would want to do. Um, and I think it was very challenging for me um, to find somewhere between trying to get a job that paid and you could, you know, have some kind of reliable income for a period of time um, that might be renewable. Um, somewhere between that sort of early to mid career uh, and then the question of, why am I doing this? What is my, am I trying to find the answer to a question? Uh, what is the purpose of what I'm doing? Uh, and in fact, I think I didn't really find that until I came back from the US um, 2001 and joined Institute Pasteur uh, as a permanent staff at that time as a permanent offer. Um, but I think I understood the purpose of what I wanted to do and realized in fact, I done the job of being a research scientist and jumps all of the hurdles you're meant to jump as you move to getting tenured, for example. And I could have stood for tenure in uh, South Carolina and probably sure uh, that that would have been an option. Uh, but in fact, I realized that I was not motivated by that. And in fact, the idea of service uh, and science and the, the sense of science having a, a function uh, that uh, it has a role in society became very uh, powerful for me. Uh, and so I, I gladly uh, took this alternative route to turn towards working in a more facility driven context and a more team oriented co context and believe fundamentally that, that that has an enormously high value that, that serves the purpose of assuring that those that don't want to do that don't have to, um, but at the same time, making sure that uh, uh, at the same time, those that, uh, uh, want to pursue their research, have the opportunity to do so. Um, and knowing that whatever research ideas may come to me or the people I'm working with, that some, somehow they'll translate into a benefit for the many uh, as much as just the realization of a specific point in a specific question for a specific few. I've got, uh, I'm going to change tack. Uh, so just to get a bit more, you, you probably don't realize that uh, Alex Sosick and myself. Uh, so we both got a uh, friend, a uh, shared friend with Alex. I've uh, been playing a bit of ping pong with you. So every time you email or speak to Alex, you pass on your regards to me through <laughs> Alex. And every time I speak to Alex, I'm passing my regards on to yourself. So actually, I, I have to say, I, I said I was talking to you today and Alex said, oh, please pass on my regards. So, uh, <laughs> Alex, you've now got evidence. I do pass on your regards <laughs> to Spencer. 
we didn't know how long we could carry this on but every email if you go back we'll say oh by the way pete or by the way alex says hello uh, <laughs> we couldn't resist. break that chain i'm gonna break that chain i'll write directly to alex <laughs> yeah but you've got to say you've got to, no you don't break that chain anyway no. <laughs> <laughs> some quick questions for you <laughs> we quite often chill out in the evenings uh, at different meetings and stuff what would be your preference wine or beer I used to be a wine without a question person. I think uh, I was young then. I thought of wine as being sophisticated. And um, now I'm old enough to realize that I'm not that sophisticated. And I love, I love a beer. I really enjoy a beer in a way that I'm ashamed to admit. I, I, I enjoy specifically stouts. I was just about to ask you if it was a porter, stout, ale or lager. So it's a stout type. It's a stout, and I will definitely weigh in on the side of a porter as well. Uh, <laughs> I love a milk stout. I, 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 I buy all kinds of different stouts. I go to breweries to taste stouts. I love stout. There you go. You had it. You found it. Nice out. dark <laughs> beer. I know what to get you next time. Line it up in front of you so that that's nice and easy. Sitting at home, what would you rather do? Watch TV or read a book? Um, I these are quick fire questions. Yeah, come on. Well, TV is not really the you, you, yeah. I guess I would say I would probably watch TV if it was. Uh, I don't know TV. Yes, okay. TV. So, That's the reality of it. Take you back. Take you back to you can watch any TV pro. What is your what is your what is your genre of TV? What do you like to watch on TV? What, before CNN <laughs> and BBC the news all the time. If you had a choice, what sort of thing would you engage with on TV? Is it going to be comedy? Is it going to be factual? Is it going to be fictional? I, I, love, I love comedy. And it's something I miss about Britain is the um, constant diet of high quality uh, comedy, irreverent um, comedy. Uh, and I love the, the, you know, the whole British sense of humour and yeah, the irreverent comedy. I miss that. So at home, would you, uh, would you get, a, if you were, would you rather eat in or eat out? Before COVID. Yeah, before COVID, forget COVID. Eat, eat in all the time. I would prefer to eat out. I love eating out. Enjoy so if you're out. eating in, would you get a takeaway or cook? Before COVID. Yeah. Uh, I, if I have, at the time, and I know they're not the constraint. I love, I enjoy cooking, okay. as does my, my, my partner. And your partner's a good cook? She is now. Uh, what now, just for this podcast? Because you know she'll listen on a walk when she's storming up a hill? <laughs> we, I, I think the two of us um, are part of our, uh, our um, uh, relationship. I think it's been, actually, we enjoy cooking together. We, we sometimes uh, take the time to cook together. Sometimes we'll cook separately, and we enjoy that as well. But... Uh, I think we've sort of learned and honed our cooking skills together. You say you cook, sometimes cook separately. I, I, I presume you mean on different days and not cooking one meal each. For... One, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, one, one might offer to cook for everybody. Yes. That would, be, would be the idea. See, that's why you miss British humour, isn't it? So uh, you're a perfect person to ask this. Long haul or short haul flights in normal times? Um, I actually prefer long haul flights because I think that's the only time you can justify the necessity of flying. Um, in France, which is a fairly, it's a fairly large country, um, you can fly from Paris to Nice rather quickly, but uh, bottom line is you can get a train pretty quickly from one end to the other as well. Um, so why would you take the plane? It doesn't really make that much sense. I'm probably going to lose air miles now with Air France for saying that, but you know, that's the truth of the matter. Uh, long haul flights, I think, are, are exciting. They still have the magic of, um, uh, of you know, flying. It's something special, isn't it? Yeah, and you only get that on long haul. And you know what? I think long haul is the only time you can really switch off. Yeah. I don't, I don't I actually, I, the last couple of times I have had to work on the long hauls as well. But for most of it, you can have a glass of wine or two and just indulge in movies. It's the only time I get to watch movies. I didn't realise I liked them so much until I started doing a few long haul each year. But 
Uh, what's your favourite publication uh, that you have authored or co-authored? What is your favourite publication? Uh, probably my favourite publication. Ooh, that's a difficult one. The co-authored as well. Um, I think co-authored... Ooh, that's really very difficult. I'll give you two. Um, you can choose two. <laughs> right, okay. Um, in that case, then I would say probably, I, I would say, actually, maybe I shouldn't even hesitate about it. it it's the um, uh, Nature Medicine uh, 20, I guess it would be 2007, 2006, I think, uh, which is the, um, uh, with Freddie Frischnick, who's now uh, in Heidelberg, uh, who's a very gifted uh, parasitologist and actually inspired me to really understand the value of looking at parasitology as a cell biology problem, um, uh, which he does uh, to, to, to a T now. Uh, <clears throat> and in that paper, um, it's a story of the malaria sporozoids moving uh, in from the mosquito uh, bite site, the ear of a mouse, and then entering into the vessels yeah. of the um, uh, of the uh, uh, mouse and being delivered eventually to the liver, and it's just one of the most astounding pieces of work. I think I was uh, very lucky to be uh, among so many very talented people, uh, but particularly Freddie and Genevieve Milan, who's not actually an author, but she's a very gifted, uh, uh, very senior uh, parasitologist in in uh, Pasteur who gave us the ideas and the, the audacity to actually even try to make that experiment work. And um, I think that was, yeah, that was a joy, that paper, that, that paper I would say. So I, we are nearly out of time. So you, you said I have to pick this picture because <laughs> this is, I, I don't know who's on the kayak first, <laughs> but the number of pictures I have been sent by different people that have them with a kayak. There's just something about it. <laughs> you're the maybe, third, fourth, maybe even fifth person with a kayak. You could collate. I think as a kayak is a, is a state of mind, isn't it? It's something that everybody feels um, uh, a certain, there's a certain freedom of being there. This picture is actually of my son when he was, uh, I think perhaps um, nine years old, 10 years old. Um, the, kayak we're in is in South Carolina and we were stopped because there were fish jumping out of the water over the bow of the boat and um, uh, we were trying to catch a picture and uh, I love this picture because you see my foot at the back I sort of get kind of just uh, laid back and I was just taking in the silence of where we were and the the um, uh, uh, I think just the serenity of the moment so it was always um yeah, something that just stuck in my mind of being a, a wonderful experience at a, a wonderful time of, of uh, the development of my young son at that time. Uh, and I haven't been in a kayak for a very long time since then, for all kinds of different reasons. I think yeah. my back doesn't allow me to even even steer a kayak nowadays. Yeah. Oh, that, that's an age thing, Spencer. Yeah, I so I miss that, that view. I, I, miss, I miss that view somehow. Uh, you say, I, I'm just looking through the photos that you sent, and you said how you like... Uh, British comedy and yet you sent me a load of pictures so this is a, an Aston Martin which is a jet which I think is out of a Bond movie so are, are you a complete Bond fanatic? I was back in the day I read all of the Ian Fleming when I was eight years old I think I, I started reading Bond novels uh, Ian Fleming and I by the time I was 12 I read them all I think um, so I was a Bond fan and um, this became a part of my life, in fact, because my parents who, they make wigs, um, hair pieces uh, for films and theater and stuff. And in fact, when I was very young, I was gifted a signed autograph photo from Sean Connery, who had come to have his hair piece fitted uh, in my, in my uh, parents' place of business, uh, hairdressers in West London. And, um, uh, my, my dad had, and my mother had asked for this um, signed copy of the of Sean Connery's uh, autographed uh, photo. So I was very excited by this. Anyway, the point is that picture of the DB5, obviously that's, you know, Bond's car. 
I live vicariously through the youth of my son. So basically I use my son as an excuse to go into the Bond exhibition that was in London a few years back. Um, I think it was like 2012, a year just before, yeah, it was 2012, I think it was. And um, uh, I yeah, used my, my son as an excuse to go to this thing. And I enjoyed it probably more, more than he did because I was, I was on a little childhood trip, rushing around looking at all of the old Bond paraphernalia, which I like. Uh, and it was an opportunity to take my son back so that he could understand he has a British passport um, and that we still have a connection with Britain, despite the fact that we are so rarely back there now, uh, in fact. And, um, you know, I hope that he'll have the opportunity to, to get back to Britain and learn his roots. That's it. Yeah, well, I wouldn't say James Bond is his roots, but there you are. Uh, and I suppose the roots is the right word to use if if it was for wigs at the time that you actually got into this, I suppose Root is actually the perfect phrase <laughs> to use at the same time, isn't it? So at least I know where your, where your roots come from now. Uh, <laughs> because we are, we are out of time now and we haven't talked about core technologies for life sciences. And that's something okay. if, if people don't know about, you really must go and look at what core technologies for life sciences is all about. Uh, Cause that's mm -hmm. an initiative that actually yourself Spencer started up, got going and moved forward. And actually got off the ground and that's going very nicely now so please do look at again that's all about community uh, very much about community and helping scientists around europe at this point and bringing them together with a common common need common voice and common support uh, but i'm going to leave you with one last question which is what is your best science joke and don't say me I, I thought I got away with this. I thought we'd overrun the time. I, yeah, no, I was, I was never going to let that one slip. Or just your best joke. Come on, you've got a, you've got a young son. You must have a good joke. <laughs> you put me on the spot. I, 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 am, I, I am a humorless child. I honestly cannot think of a... You should have prepared me for that. I would have come up with something. Well, but I, 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 I told you this before we started. <laughs> but that would involve having a functional memory. Well, back to artificial intelligence, aren't we? <laughs> You're going to have to go for the joke, Pete. So you are the, the humour meister. That is my question to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> one day you can, you can flip these tables around and then I'll do one. Well, on that bombshell, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to give you a joke. You know what's going to happen? We're going to sign off here and then a joke is going to pop into my head. Yeah, but don't tell me who that person is because that would be rude. Spencer, <laughs> it's just been really lovely to catch up with you again. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for actually watching or listening to the Microscopists. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel or whichever subscription, uh, whichever channel you're actually listening or watching this. It is worth watching them just for the pictures that we've seen today. Uh, and I miss some great pictures of food. He obviously loves his food because uh, there are a ton of pictures that he sent of glorious food markets that you can see um, through to yeah really fine food um, mm. which I bet you didn't cook that did you Spencer? Uh, that one is I don't think that that's us. Yeah, yeah I think I, 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 you're too messy to do something that anyway, that note, <laughs> <laughs> I that anyway on that note I should leave thank you everyone and thank see you, you. thanks Spencer. Okay, take care. Thank you for listening to The Microscopists, a bite-sized bio podcast sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. To view all audio and video recordings from this series, please visit bitesizebio.com forward slash the microscopists.